before we get into the nitty gritty, less than 24 hours, how are you feeling emotionally, physically? How are you guys doing? Yeah, we're doing um, so much better than um, maybe we would ever anticipate. Um, just uh, the training that we've received, uh, working together as a team. My husband and I have been married for 26 years. Uh, there were a lot of factors that, that played into, into this. Um, there was also, uh, so we're feeling great, thank you. Um, none of us, either of us have any major injuries, just a little bit of shock and we were pretty chilly yesterday. <laughs> but we're, we're all warmed up and just so grateful to be here with our family celebrating Easter today. Were you able to come home last night or did you come home this morning? Yeah, no, we came home, I think around 8.30 p.m. So the crash happened around three. Um, we were rescued very quickly and so grateful to all those um, who, who assisted us in that endeavor and then received care at Rhode Island Hospital. Coming home and, and seeing your family, getting to hug them, knowing you, you had minor bumps and bruises for you know, a pretty catastrophic incident. What was that like, the emotions just coming through the door? And you know, the entire incident, during the entire thing, I, I wasn't emotional. It was all very straightforward. Matter of fact, this is what we need to do next. Okay, here's where we're at. Okay, we're both okay. Um, okay, let's tell our friends that we're okay. Um, but yes, you, you nailed it. Coming in the door to your home and seeing um, all five of my kids and my son-in-law definitely gave a, a overwhelming sense of gratitude. Um, no tears, but it was, a, it was a wash of Thanksgiving for sure. All right, we're gonna take you back a little bit now. Throughout the day, I know you, you guys were flying, you know, a typical day trip. Tell me a little bit before coming back to Quonset where you guys were. Okay, yeah, my husband Paul and I love uh, to fly and it's interesting having a married couple who both fly because the conversation is inevitably, well, who gets to fly? So this particular day, um, our main mission was to get our little, we have a Cessna 150 two-seater airplane um, that needed to go for its annual inspection. But instead of just flying straight to take it to its inspection, we said, well, let's make a date out of it. So my husband was flying that aircraft um, and we flew, uh, he flew from Richmond to Chatham and then I flew um, the Yellow Comanche from Quonset to Chatham. We met up at Chatham and had breakfast. We had a lovely breakfast at Chatham. And then um, we proceeded uh, northbound up towards Provincetown, just sightseeing, both in our separate planes. Um, and then we flew across to Mansfield, um, me first, ahead of him. So then we dropped off that 150, and this was actually the first flight of the day that we were, had been together. I think a lot of people maybe don't realize that, but this was a 12, 15 minute flight from Mansfield, Massachusetts, back to Quonset. Um, Plenty of fuel on board. We were on a half mile final. We were so close to the runway at about 800 feet. Um, and the winds were gusting, but we were, we were fine. We were established. Um, and uh, I think we might have had like up to a 20 knot headwind though. When I suddenly um, sought to add a little bit of power to gain a little bit of height uh, on my <clears throat> approach and I had no power. So I, there was nothing to be had. Um, so I ran my checklists, uh, my engine out checklist as, as quickly as I could, getting through about 75%, realizing there was, we weren't gonna make the runway. So um, I was able to call out a mayday on the radios to Quonset Tower and um, prepare for impact and we both braced and the next thing we knew we were in the water. That's nothing like you've ever experienced ever before as a pilot. I've never experienced that, thankfully, but I did train for it with um, uh, my husband and I both volunteer for Civil Air Patrol, and um, I took an air crew survival course, including water, open water survival, um, at Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to my instructors there because we had makeshift simulated cockpits complete with seatbelts and headsets um, and we were pushed backwards into a pool and we had to escape out of the this contraption and it was <clears throat> a lot of that course was also about survival like what does it take to survive it's a it's a mentality it's a mindset and all of those things came to the forefront of my mind and i think 
you know, I definitely asked God to watch over us and help us and thanked him that we were even like crawling out of this plane onto the wing was kind of amazing that we, neither of us were injured. But I was also saying, we are not going to die today. You know, just that instinctual, like, what do we have to do next? What's the next thing? You said during the, the actual downfall that you had to stay quite stoic, right? Was it kind of, you know, instinctual that took over? Was it very calculated in your mind? Were you present in the moment or were you kind of just doing, you know, what you were trained to do? Uh, I think the training played a huge role as well as some instinct. And my husband, kudos to him, he had been reading um, the emergency um, checklists as we, he was flying slowly up <laughs> towards Provincetown because of the headwinds in a little 150. Um, and we had been discussing something earlier. So he was looking at the checklist and um, he had the mindset, he had the foresight to unlatch and open the door before impact, which may have saved our lives because um, you never know, you know, if you can't get the door open against the water pressure, that would have been an entirely different scenario. And the Piper Comanche only has one exit. It has one door on the passenger side. So that door was open and ready for us to, to get out. So we just took the next steps. Um, so there was a lot of instinct, but there was a lot of the training becomes instinct. Mm -hmm. You know, the more you rehearse your, your emergency checklist, the more training you receive, the more safety seminars you attend, it all makes a difference. So you're, you're embracing for impact. Uh, we were talking to Chris, right? And he was saying that that's a, a big feat to be able to land and then get out. Um, mm. Tell me a little bit about that experience and then after getting out of the plane, what your next thoughts were to call for help and things like that. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, I've never in my life encountered that before mm -hmm. where you suddenly have to make uh, significant decisions about things that are important and you think they're really, really important, but then suddenly you realize, oh, these aren't important at all. Like surviving is the most important thing. For example, I looked in the back and my logbook, you know, um, all my purse with all my identification, um, all of my, my certificates and everything for being a pilot, mm -hmm. um, as well as equipment that, that, that's costly. And you're looking at all of that and you're like, I want to bring that with me, but I have to start swimming pretty soon. So anyway, that was a kind of a freeze frame moment uh, in which we both looked at each other and said, we have to leave it all. I did have the mindset to keep my phone and um, as we crawled out of the plane and onto the, so that was the next step, leave it all behind, get out of the plane, which is what we did. And we both took a wing. We were both on um, the separate right and left wings. Um, and the nose was nose down <clears throat> and taking on water rapidly. So the airplane was like this. And then it started to really go quickly. Um, and then the tail was coming up out of the water. So by the very end, we were just kind of hanging on to the tail. I was ready to start swimming immediately. That was another really awesome presence of mind that my husband had. He said, no, we have to stay with the aircraft like and out of the water as long as possible. So um, I followed his lead on that and I was actually swimming away and then swam back uh, and jumped on the, <clears throat> the aircraft with him um, for those last moments. It, it all happened so quickly. I think. I think the plane went down in less than five minutes though. But I did call 911, interestingly, while I was hanging out on the wing for a minute or two. Um, I was, anyway, I, I called 911 <clears throat> and I just gave them, they asked my location, it was a little bit comical. I was like, I'm in the bay. <laughs> I think they were like, what? <laughs> um, and I said, we're in the middle of the bay in a crashed aircraft, send emergency services to the end of runway 23 at Quonset, that's where we're swimming to. And then I didn't have any other time past that. By then, the tail was about to go down, and we had to shift from the wing to the tail and then start swimming. If you hadn't had your cell phone, I know you had the Mayday call that was into to Quonset. Would they have been? Absolutely. Okay. No, the, yeah, um, never underestimate the guys who sit up in the tower. Mm -hmm. They're incredible people, and um, I, know that, I, I know that calls were going out as soon as I said that Mayday. Um, I had pilot friends contacting us less than an hour after the incident. So you, you know that the word goes out, you know that um, they, there were emergency service vehicles lining the shorelines from runway two, three to where we ended up um, going over to the right. 
So the plane's submerging. Are you guys starting to swim? Are you treading water, holding on to buoys? What it? What Do you want to know a funny, funny yeah. part of this story? So the, the airplane is submerging and I look at my husband and I'm like, we have to swim away. It's like the Titanic. We're going to get pulled down. <laughs> and he's like, I don't think those forces are quite quite strong enough like with, with this plane. <laughs> but that was my first thought. I'm like, I don't want to get sucked under. <laughs> anyway, as soon as the tail um, went under and there was nothing left to hold on to, we started swimming. But um, it was a lot of, again, God's grace and um, just preparing us for a moment like that. We both love to swim. Mm -hmm. We both swim three times a week. I have dear friends that I swim with in the bay, not when it's 42 degrees, but when it's a little bit warmer in the summer months, um, I've been loving uh, the ocean and, and swimming in, in the bay. So we both just start swimming and that was quite natural, unnatural to be so cold, but sure. you just keep swimming. And in fact, we both had um, presence of mind the whole time and we were having conversations and I was encouraging Paul you know, go on your back so the wind, the waves, it was very windy, so mm -hmm. he was kind of taking on a lot of water in his face, and I was going um, elementary backstroke um, to avoid that. But we were talking, like, the whole time. Was there ever a moment when you're in the water, the, the plane's gone, that you thought, I might not survive this now, or was that yeah. kind of a point where... <clears throat> um, we were both starting, I, I don't know, if time kind of stands still during events like this. Um, <clears throat> I think, I want to say we were swimming for 10 to 15 minutes based on the distance that we covered. Um, like I said, I think we were about a half a mile from touchdown, uh, from the end zone um, uh, of the runway. And I want to say that we swam like almost half of that distance. That's what it seemed like. And we were swimming for what felt like at least a while. Um, but we swim a lot. And so judging accordingly, I, I think probably at least a 10, if not a 15 minute swim. We were just getting to the point, my husband said, let's not go to the end of two, three, there's land closer over here. <clears throat> so we started to change our course from straight to two, three, to the right hand side. And, um, and we, were start, we were starting to slow down and not keep pace with each other. Um, so yeah, there was a moment where I was like, are we gonna be, am I, can I tow Paul? Like I'm about to like, he had a lot more clothing on. He had a leather jacket on. Um, so it was harder. It was harder for him than me. And he'd been taking on all that water during the front uh, breaststroke. So yeah, we, um, there was a moment where I was like, I'm not sure if we're going to make it. And then I'm like, nope, we're not going to die today. <laughs> we're going to make it. We'll just keep swimming. And then I think just moments later is when, is it DEM mm -hmm. um, came to our rescue. You see that boat. They, they pull you on board um, to go to the, the harbor, right? Or Yeah, I'm not exactly sure where they took us. Did that fatigue and that kind of relief and all of that anxiety kind of just hit you in that moment? Was it still that adrenaline? Um, I, I had the adrenaline for probably the next two hours. <laughs> so that didn't just crash for me. I, I kind of stayed on for quite a while. It definitely hit Paul um, and... He also has, um, yeah, he, they took good care of us, but um, <clears throat> yes, there was, for one of us, I think it, it hit hard, and for me, it didn't hit till much later, but it does hit, and then you're very fatigued. You were saying he had some kind of neck. <clears throat> yeah, he just needed to be immobilized, and I mean, we did crash, so mm -hmm. there's a whiplash component to that, so they, we were just bracing him to make sure his neck was stable. All right, taking you back a little bit away from the crash. Yeah. How long have you been flying? Everyone calls you the aviator family. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I grew up in uh, a two-seater Cessna 150. Uh, my parents um, were separated and I lived in the mountains of Pennsylvania. My dad lived in York, Pennsylvania. And so that's how he used to come get me. So I grew up sleeping mostly in a plane as I was being transported back and forth in Pennsylvania. But I, I loved the plane and I was never afraid of the plane. Um, <clears throat> and so when I graduated college, I said, if I don't get into PT school, I'm gonna go get my pilot certificate. And I did get into PT school and then I had five children and then we lived abroad. And so there's this whole long you know, story in between. But then in 2019, my daughter Kara 
um, joined the Civil Air Patrol mm -hmm. and became very interested in flight. And as soon as my father heard about that, he had <laughs> stopped flying um, and let his, you know, his license lapse. But as soon as he heard, got wind of her interest, he was all, all back in and all, all on board and just really encouraged and equipped and supported her endeavors to become a private pilot. But then of course, her um, parents, both of us were like, well, we wanna fly too. And so <laughs> we all started learning. Um, Kara first and then myself and then Paul got our private pilot certificate. And then I <clears throat> uh, had the privilege of going on to get my instrument and commercial as well as Kara. So both Kara and I have our commercial ratings. What year was that Certif when you bought your... Um, so we started in, uh, I, I'll just speak for myself, I don't know everybody's dates. Sure, sure. But I, um, I earned my private pilot certi certificate in February 2021. Mm -hmm. Awesome, very cool. I, I don't know if you've had these conversations with Paul yet, you know, the af after. And, and just talked about kind of the emotions and, and everything that really happened. Have you had those conversations? Oh yeah, lots of them. Mm -hmm. And the, I think what's not beneficial is to, to discuss the what ifs, you know. Mm. Um, there's a lot of things that could have panned out really differently. So we're trying to avoid those and yet, you know, talk about them because we're not gonna stop flying. Like, we're gonna keep flying. And you just always need to keep running those checklists Keep yourself sharp. Keep, um, you know, keep reminding yourself of your emergency procedures, and then do your best when things happen. They do happen, but flight is still so much safer than any time you get in the car. It sounds to me, and it sounds to me like you took your training. The fact that you both swim, mm -hmm. those all played a big part. Correct me if I'm wrong. And it sounds like you guys kept a real level head throughout this whole thing, even though it sounds like for some part of you was kind of maybe screaming, you know, am I not going to make this? But do you think, it sounds to me like your training and your swimming uh, all played a part in the fact that you guys yeah, kept would, the cool head. Uh, I'd had say, that not been the case, <clears throat> do you think that would have been a little bit different for you? I don't know. I can't really speak to that because I just, we just are who we are. We're not something else um, other, but I would also include in that list. So our, our training, our, our swimming, but our faith, you know, I don't, neither of us are afraid to die. We, we have a, a hope of heaven that's real. And, um, but we don't take unnecessary risks or foolish risks, but also we don't, we don't shy away from living life to its fullest and believing that our times are in God's hands. So I think those three things put together and, you know, we're just, we're so grateful to all the people who've invested in us, all of our flight instructors, the, the people that I've just jumped in with on occasion, they, they all, all their voices come to the forefront of your mind. Um, and there's one, one gentleman who just last year at Sun and Fun, Gary Reeves, he says, there is no emergency when there really is an emergency, but like you just keep your head and you fly. I think Bob Hoover once said, you don't stop flying a plane until the plane stops flying. Like you fly the plane until the very end. So some of those little quips actually came to the forefront of my mind. How important was the communication point <clears throat> between you and your husband to keep that level head? If you were alone, maybe what would that train of thought be different? How would that train of thought be different? And you know, how crucial looking back at it now, do you think being able to reason with each other and, you know, have that collaborative team mindset that we're going to survive? What did that look like? Um, like I said, Paul and I've been married for 26 years. We, um, we definitely don't have it all worked out. Um, communication is always a work in progress for everyone. But in this particular instance, his presence has always grounded me. Um, if I were to have been alone, would it have been different? I don't know. Um, but I know that it was really nice to be together. And when I started swimming off by myself, because um, I can have a little bit of an independent streak. So I went and I started swimming off by myself and looked back and saw him like, we, I'm staying on the plane till the plane goes under. <laughs> and I was like, we're staying together. And I swam back and you know got on the plane with him. 
And then that was, that was the mantra for the entire swim, just like stay together and keep talking and <clears throat> encouraging one another. What was the last, for me, last question, what was the reception you got from your family, friends, when you guys finally hmm. got together? How, how, what was the emotions? Well, let me just say, first, a shout out to the aviation community. There's no one, there's no other group like the aviation community. They're, they're just a, a great bunch of people who, um, you know, I think sometimes get stereotyped as wealthy doctors, which is ironic because... Where my <laughs> husband's a doctor. But there's so many different kinds of people that make up the aviation community, and they are often just so bright, um, but courageous, um, fun loving, loyal, and everyone looks out for everyone else. We know, we know there are risks every time you go up in the air. And um, I've learned so much from my aviation friends about safety, about good decision making about supporting one another, about being, just being there. And I, they were the first ones. The, my phone was, well, first of all, it's a little bit of a miracle that my phone survived. My phone survived that swim. It wasn't the last thing I did after calling 911 was like, I put the phone down my shirt and was like, here we go. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm really thankful for my phone. I have no idea how it survived, but, <laughs> but it did. Um, and um, in the emergency room, as we were there for several hours, the, the calls just and the text messages kept coming in and the all the first folks to to check in on us other than family were were the aviation aviation community so we love you guys and we're so grateful for all that they've taught us uh, as far as any <laughs> advice you would give to any future pilots uh, who may find themselves in a similar experience what would you tell them <laughs> okay we had two life vests but they were in the baggage compartment. So if you're gonna carry life vests, I mean, there was a quick swap of things from one plane to another. So mm -hmm. it was a bit of an odd circumstance um, with one plane going into the shop and switching gear from one plane to another. But if you're gonna carry life vests, and you should in this area where we fly over water, mm -hmm. have them accessible. It's kind of stupid to have two life vests and have them not accessible. Um, but more importantly it's to keep learning keep training keep always be teachable always um, be willing to learn from others there's so many incredible pilots all around us in this area people who have thousands of hours like use your resources and um, ask them questions and get to know them as well as personal study and um, continue to you'll never <laughs> jim burns from east greenwich always says I have over this many thousands of hours and I'll never know everything there is to know. There's always more to know. So um, that's my advice. Keep learning, keep, keep challenging yourself. And perhaps a little bit of uh, Gary Reeves advice, like there is no real emergency or you can't allow yourself the fight or flight response to paralyze you. Like you have to keep, just keep functioning when an emergency does occur. You're such a light. I have one last one for me. It's yeah. kind of a two-parter. What is from, you can dumb it down a little bit for, for me, but what are those checks, those standard checks before you go up in the air that you guys do every time, I, I'm sure, and then kind of what happens now into the investigation portion as, you know, the plane's gone. So how do they figure out what caused the malfunction? Sorry, two parts. Yeah, so that's a really involved question. Um, what are the checks involved before you take a plane and go up in the air. Um, we call that pre-flight, your pre-flight checklist. It's extensive. I, 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 but the, the main things, if you were going to you know, prioritize, you, you do them all, um, but the things that you're probably most interested in are like you always check your fuel and you also sump your fuel, your fuel to make sure there's not water, it's not contaminated. Um, you check your oil, you check your tire pressure, um, you check all of your surfaces and your leading edges. Um, there's so much more. I mean, on the Comanche, they have tabs uh, that lock down the, the hood or the mm -hmm, cowling, mm -hmm. the cow cover. I always check those to make sure they're secure. You check your lights. Uh, we could go on and on and on. But you did that and didn't see anything out of the ordinary yesterday. I did not. And I had, like I said, I had two beautiful flights mm -hmm. prior to this one. I mean, we were actually marveling at this machine saying, it has a particularly strong engine. It sounds good. It feels powerful. Um, I 
it wasn't my typical plane. Um, I fly a different Comanche usually, and we were comparing and contrasting them and just saying, wow, this plane feels great. And then it just stopped, you know, just at that last minute the engine gave out. So I did, the, you asked about checklists. There's also the pre-landing checklist, which is imperative. Um, and we had, we had done that checklist thoroughly. Um, so there's something called um, <clears throat> the Gumps checklist. So your um, gas, and I made sure my fuel was on the fullest tank with the fuel pump on. Undercarriage is, are my wheels down? In this case, they were. I wanted to put them up because that would have made for a smoother landing without that nose dive. Mm. Um, but I didn't have time. There wasn't time to put the gear back up. Um, and then mixture, you want your engine to be getting, you know, a full, full mixture and, um, uh, sorry, gas, undercarriage, mixture, pump, and switches. So your fuel pump is on, and then you check all your switches and your seat belts. So that checklist, you run two or three times before you land. Oh. And, um, and we had done that, so, yeah, what happened will yet to be determined. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. but It wasn't your plane? Do you own the plane? or? So the plane was my late father's. My father, who I spoke of, um, passed away last year um, around this time. And we've been trying to sell that plane. But a plane that sits is, is not good. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a plane that we were taking up to give it some exercise and, and fly it. So was that the plane that you were in? Is that, is that was the plane, yes. 